first question is a sort of three-part question, but feel free to pick and choose what aspect of it you answer or answer all of it. Um, how did you decide to step into public life? Um, who did you talk to before you made up your mind? And was there anything that held you back? And just answer as you, uh, as you feel. Like, whoever wants to answer first can start. I, I'll step in, I guess, in the, in the <laughs> silence. Um, I first, uh, I, I'm the mayor now, um, but I started out as a councillor, so I, I ran in the uh, 2008 election um, for a seat on council, so I had uh, four years in that role. And um, my incentive for running for council initially was uh, a passion for um, for my community in general, I think, but, but there was um, a very hot topic issue that really kind of um, pushed me past that, um, what would have been my comfort zone in, in staying in the background, because that's where I am most comfortable, and, and that was around uh, schools and uh, closure of schools in the communities, and um, I got very involved in that discussion and um, was, I think, disappointed with the um, positions that um, my community leaders were taking on that issue, and so felt that uh, there needed to be a different perspective on the council. So that was my incentive to get involved in, in the first place, to run for a seat on council, and then to take the step up to mayor um, was another huge one. Um, <laughs> But uh, I was uh, very much, I, I, I knew a lot of the issues in my community, I'd been involved, um, I, I, I better knew what I might be getting into. Um, but I think the encouragement of the retiring mayor was certainly key to that. So, um, and a number of, uh, I think, uh, m uh, my colleagues on council were also supportive of me um, stepping into that role. So, um, I took that step. There you go. <laughs> um, I've been on council a couple of times. This is, I think, my third, um, third time um, with a break in between. So originally, the, uh, I got involved in municipal politics partly because that was a tradition within my family. I, I grew up with a family that very much uh, felt that um, giving back wasn't uh, just something you should do. You really needed to do if you wanted to be connected and and uh, doing good work in your community. So that's where what got me into it originally. Um, the last time I ran, partly because at the time all of the candidates were largely retired, and I felt it was really important to have somebody who was uh, still working and still in the business community, kind of somebody. Um, with skin in the game, for lack of a better term, uh, on council and able to be involved in some of that decision making. So that was the real impetus for me, was making sure that there was a little bit more diversity within that group of people. Um, yeah, so I think uh, the reason why I ran uh, is, I, I guess I want to say clearly, is I don't see this as a career. I uh, am in my second term and uh, I have uh, about, in September, announced that I would not be re-offering again. Um, before I was elected the first time, I uh, had said to my family and to myself that this was really, if I was successful the first time and the second time, that I would not reoffer for a third time. So I made it very clear to myself and to my family that this was not a career, that if uh, it is something that I saw during a period of my life that I would be interested in doing. Um, and I think that really the reasons, I, I, I never considered doing this. You know, 10 years ago, if someone had said you'd be a municipal councillor, I'd say you have to be absolutely crazy. I would never do that. You know, why would I do that? I've got other things I want to do. I sort of lived more of in an activist type of role in terms of uh, working in the community as a volunteer. So becoming a politician would not uh, necessarily... Um, it would be hard to continue with that sort of activist position that, that I, I might have taken on certain issues. So, uh, so it really was a step in a difference uh, for me. But I think the reasoning was that um, I had a couple friends continue to ask me, why don't you consider running? Then when I talked to my family, they said, 
yeah, you should run, this would be great, you know. I don't think they really understood what, the, what was going to happen to us as a family. And, um, and then, you know, I think because I, I felt that this may be an opportunity to bring forward some of the issues and things that I felt were really important around sustainability, uh, you know, active transportation, affordable housing. These are all things that I was concerned about in my community, that this may be a place to be able to do some effective work. But it was always in the context that this is not, for me, a career. And I was going to keep it to a very time limited amount of time that I was going to be involved in it. So, uh, yeah, so I jumped into it. And um, I think, you know, the thing it, on holding back, I think probably the good thing was I really didn't know what it was going to be about. So I'm not going to say much today. <laughs> but if I'd really known, I think, uh, some of the things, I might have really had decided not to do that. I remember my father coming to me uh, when I was sort of making the decision and he said, Jennifer, do you really know what it's like down there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, my father's not a political person, but you know, it's not a nice place sometimes. Are you ready for that? I said, okay, Dad, I think I understand what you're saying. Yeah, I think I'm okay. <laughs> but you know, not quite sure what, what you know what that is, and my father wasn't. It didn't have any political connections in terms of, of, of working on that, but just from his own uh, observation. And I think the other thing that sort of probably really pushed me forward was the fact there was no incumbent, uh, because a woman who had been running in the district, Sheila Fugier, was running for mayor, so there's no longer incumbent. So that just sort of opened up the conversation. Probably if there had been an incumbent, I would not run. So again, that's for me a really important thing about why I am not running again is I think it offers the opportunity for people to stand up and think, oh, there's no one running. What does that mean? Why, you know, what that, what is that about? Is there some possibility now? It's, it's much harder to defeat an incumbent, I, I believe. And so I just know in my own experience that was one of the important things that sort of helped me really think, is this something that I want to do? Thank you. Well, and I think we've, we've heard a fair bit in past campaign schools, and I think sort of Mark alluded to it earlier, that um, you have to develop a bit of a thick skin in uh, being in the public light in this way and, and a representative. So I guess I'd love to hear about your different or maybe similar approaches to dealing with that criticism that comes with the territory. <laughs> well, I think it takes practice. Um, it's never, I don't think it's ever easy. Um, I, I find uh, criticism difficult. I take it more personally than I should. But I also, I, I grew up in a family that was a little bit in the public eye, if you can be in Lunenburg County. And um, my mother taught me from a very young age that if someone was talking about you, they weren't talking about someone else, and so just consider it a gift to somebody else. So that's kind of the way I've always looked at it. Doesn't always make it easier. <laughs> but, you know, that's, that's the way it is. And I didn't grow up in a family that was into a great deal of gossip. The group of people that I hang out with, I'm sure gossip about me, but don't gossip with me. So I'm often out of the loop in that respect of what's going on and what people are saying. It's, it's tough to make decisions and stand behind them and make sure when you're being criticized that you remember that people are talking about their the decision or, or the, the, the controversy or whatever's going on. They're not specifically, 99% of the time, talking about you, the person, and that, that's the piece that you have to keep in mind because it, it's really, it's difficult. It's not easy. I would, I would just yeah, emphasize or re-emphasize that point. Um, um, it's, it's important to practice and to um, reaffirm um, ongoing, uh, all the time, continuously, that uh, it's not personal. You, you can't take it personal. People will try to make it personal, and um, you have to separate yourself from that. And that's not easy, and it's not innate. It, it takes practice. And, um, but that's, that's the key, I think, to, to going on and to, to sticking what the real, and, and keep referring back to the issue or, or the, the concern and, and try to actually get down to what, you know, what, what's causing them to attack you or, or to, to speak out. And, and it's, you know, it's not the color of your hair, although that might be what they're talking about. <laughs> it's probably something else. So, so try to find out what that something else is. And, um, 
and and it will take practice and uh, hopefully people will be gentle <laughs> but when they're not um, just remember that it's not about you it's about it, it, and someone there was a saying you know I probably won't get it out right here but it was um, when someone's talk, talking about you what someone says about you says more about them than it does about you so if you can remember that and then try to think about what it's saying about them and talk to them about that it'll get you through <laughs> Um, I think for me too. I mean, echoing uh, a lot of what uh, of what um, has been said already, but it's also I think uh, understanding your own values. So if there is really a hot political issue, and you're trying to decide, you know, how I approach it, do I step out? I mean, I, I have one actually I'm dealing with right now, and finally pressed the button on the email last night at five o'clock after a lot of conversation with people, knowing that it could get very nasty, right? And I just had to sort of take a minute and say, what is it in this issue that I think is important? And what does it say to me about who I want to be as a counselor? And if it brings on, frankly, sorry, a shit storm, it's going to do that. But the reality is, that's my own internal value. And I can't control what other, how other people are going to respond about that. But that's important. I think this is important to residents and it's important to me as a counselor how I want to interact with residents, so I'm going to press that button, you know, and, and it can get very ugly, right? You know, and it can get very ugly in different ways, and I don't need to go into it, and maybe folks have other comments about this as well. I mean, there's a whole world of social media and the baiting that can happen on that and how you get hooked into or not hooked into and how you want to develop your own personal strategy for dealing with that. And then there's the in-council takedowns, which can be pretty, you know, it's, I don't know what, what your council, let me tell you. The in-council, you know, public, on the record, takedowns that happen as well around issues. So you just sort of have to find your place, like, why am I doing this? What is, it, what is important? And try to not personalize it, that I'm not doing this to get back at someone else. And I'm going to try to do this in the most open and transparent way possible. This is why I'm doing this. This is what I'm hoping the result is. This is what I'm asking for. And then people can either support you or not support you on that. But, yeah. Okay. So you, you mentioned the attacks on parents and things like a social media baiting and the council attacks. Um, maybe there's you have some more examples of what, or not, and not to put words in your mouth, maybe those things didn't surprise you going into politics, but are there, is there one thing in particular that stands out as something that really surprised you or that you weren't expecting um, going into politics? Well, maybe I can start, I can start for it. Uh, so I've had people, um, you know, uh, say to me, um, I don't agree with you on all the issues or I didn't vote for you and I'm not sure I would vote for you, but I really appreciate about how you make decisions. I know where you stand. I don't agree with you. And that's surprising, you know. I don't know that I expected that in terms of people commenting back, that uh, uh, that people, I think, uh, there will be other people that will, you know, be out there making all sorts of, you know, unhelpful sort of comments and whatever. But, you know, that people will say, uh, or they will say, you know, I, I don't elect someone to... Um, you know, that I want to know is going to fight for me on all my issues. What I want to do is elect someone who I think is going to get in there and do the very best they can, recognizing that I'm not going to agree with them all the time, or that they're going to make mistakes, but I feel that they are taking the job seriously and are really trying to work through a process of decision making that, again, is transparent, it's, it's got some coherency to it, and I don't expect perfect but I do expect that. Mm -hmm. So those types of comments coming back from people, I, 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 <clears throat> I hadn't expected those. Mm -hmm. I would say, um, going back to, uh, we're sort of jumping off from that too, I think it's um, uh, one positive and one maybe negative, and the positive is, is how rewarding it is. Um, it, it is, and, and this is, you know, uh, raw, raw for all of you who are considering it, because there's, there's some downsides that we're going to touch on as well, for sure, um, which, we, which we have already. But um, it, it is extremely rewarding. If, if you are um, uh, passionate about your community, if you love where you live, um, this is a, a job that's, that's for you. The fact that you people are here today is, is awesome. I'm, I'm really pleased to see a large group of people. So um, it is extremely rewarding. Um, 
the, the kind of just um, uh, little technical thing almost that was a huge surprise for me. And I have a background in public relations, so I thought it was a little bit more savvy um, <laughs> than I turned out to be when the campaigning got really brutal, um, which it did, and, and our mayoral election in Lunenburg last time around. And, and that was the... the um, the public perceptions that get out there that you're completely oblivious to, because you know who you are, uh, you know what you what you think, and then someone tells you because someone has more campaign signs out than you that you're losing the election, and it's like, really? <laughs> you know how does how you know how do they make that connection? But they they do, <laughs> they they make those they they draw those conclusions from some sort of really superficial um, amount of signage. So um, whether or not they would have actually voted, you know, with that perception in mind, I'm not, I'm not sure. But, but those kinds of things were very eye-opening to me, and it was um, very helpful to have people who were um, a lot more experienced in campaigning than I was to, um, to help me out in, in that whole campaign process. Oh, surprising. Um, most recently, I think the surprise on my council was the quite sure how to say this with Mark recording, um, <laughs> how um, people held preconceived notions about other candidates and brought those perceptions to the council table. So it kind of like, mm -hmm. you know who you are. Um, but there were, there were instances where, where people had really great ideas that weren't being heard because of who was articulating them, not because of the idea. Mm -hmm. And that piece I don't have a lot of patience for. I don't understand it. Um, I find that really, really difficult. So it's made for some really interesting allies around our council table, um, <laughs> some really interesting um, alliances just in terms of trying to get things through that um, get stonewalled for no reason other than, you know, which person brought it forward, which I find really quite difficult. Um, and the first time I ran, I think the thing that I found most surprising was how how truly prescriptive municipal government is, how little leeway there is for change, how in control that CAO position can be and is, and trying to get um, those positions and, and the council itself looking at ways of making change that don't necessarily change the rules. Because if you go in trying to change the rules, you'll, you'll hit the brick wall pretty quickly and want to you know, leave. It's, it's, it's not as easy to change because most of it's not changeable within your own council. It's a provincial issue or it's a federal issue. Um, but understanding that just because the process that exists has to go this way doesn't mean that you can't add to it and make it better. It just means you have to follow the steps that are there. So I think that being able to look at it in a broader picture has been a lot of fun. And, and I think our council has had a little bit of fun around, you know, how can we change? How can we do things better? And it... Maybe because we're not on camera, we also actually have a pretty good time. <laughs> we're a pretty relaxed council. may also be because we don't see very many public people there, so we don't necessarily have to be as well behaved. But uh, I, think, I think enjoying what you're doing is important too, so I think we do enjoy what we do. And I think just to follow up yeah. on that, like I'm actually one of the big surprises is the number of people that actually watch council. So there are about yeah. thirty to forty thousand people that watch HRM Council on a regular basis. And people say, Oh, I saw you in council and I think, Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> but people are actively engaged, they like to watch it, it tells them a lot about what's going on. So that is one of the strengths, mm -hmm. but it's also a challenge, I yeah. think, for council because that adds another dimension, right? Yes. About, you know, when you're on, you have eight minutes to speak to an issue, five minutes the first time, three minutes the second time. You gotta be honed in on there, you know, and, and need to know what you're gonna say. So you're on, right? Mm -hmm. And that could happen every week. You know, and there could be five issues that are directly affecting your, your district that you have to be articulate, you know, able to do that, able to get across your point and convince people about why you think that they should vote. Because in the end, it's 17 people pressing a button, right? 
That's how the decision gets made, at pressing that button. It doesn't matter about everybody else, what they're saying out there. It's the 17 people sitting around the room that press the button, and that will have a dramatic effect on, on, on your district. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a dimension. There. Are you open for questions? or just wondering about gender. Uh, uh, yeah, I can't go. <laughs> <laughs> a little more homogeneous up here. I think you're all women, but uh, you know, so, how, how is it affected? Uh, I think that's actually, that's a great question. I'm just wondering uh, if we could circle back to it when we open up sure, the audience sure. questions. We've okay, just got a couple more sure. here. Okay. Thank you for that. that yeah. opportunity, yeah. And gives you some time to think about your answers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so, Jennifer already, you sort of alluded to this, and I think Paul did too, and we've heard in the past that it's really one of the important things is having your family or your sort of support network on board going into this kind of a thing. How has uh, being in public life changed your relationship with your family? Um, I don't think it's been a negative um, from my perspective, um, but it's family impact is huge and, and you can't underestimate that and I think um, I didn't really touch on it in the beginning but um, part of the um, incentive or uh, I was at the right stage in my life to do this and, and that's key. Um, I have uh, three children who are now young adults. Uh, when I entered this role, um, my uh, two youngest were in high school, so pretty independent. <laughs> um, and so I was still a very busy mom, um, but I only worked part time, and it was, you know, I had the, the headspace and the, the, the time, and um, the, um, it was a good, I was at a crossroads somewhat, you know, going into the empty nest syndrome um, or uh, getting into that stage of my life when this, this was the right time for me to, to get involved in municipal politics. So that was huge. My family, um, my family are not political people at all. I didn't have that. I know other people have mentioned um, that that was, that was kind of what their family had been accustomed to, and mine was the exact opposite, you know, very, <laughs> very under the radar, you know, please don't shine a light on me, let me hide under a rock and push the rock forward that way. So I was, um, it was a, a big deal for me to take this, and I was very um, conscious of that for myself, but also for my family. But um, they're my biggest cheerleaders, and they're a great support, and um, couldn't do it without them. So yeah, it's been it's important. The impact is huge, and uh, but it has um, they're they're proud, and um, they, it has gotten them more politically engaged than they had been before, which is a good thing. So it's been all good. Thanks. Um, so uh, I drove down here today with my partner, so that was strategic because we haven't had a lot of time together. <laughs> so I said this would be an opportunity for us to spend time, and I actually asked him this question. I said, when we're talking about public life, do you have any comments that you might want me to share with the group? <laughs> so his comments were, um, there is less <laughs> privacy, there's less time together, uh, there's generally more stress in our lives around scheduling, but also just when issues are really, you know, happening, there's lots of comments about how it affects them. Uh, he said, I think that people been, have in our family been affected by the negative comments. So when there's been really negative stuff, uh, that that has sort of affected people, um, you know, concern. And I think, you know, one or two times when I've gotten a really... Uh, just, you know, and, and I'm not meaning to be negative, like, this is not meant to be, this is a wonderful opportunity, so thank you, Rachel, for saying it's a positive thing, because I, I don't, it's, it is positive, and I really want to encourage people to consider this, but when you get those, those voicemails, sometimes they're just, like, beyond, and you just say, can you just listen to this to see if I'm missing something here, so he's listened to one, and then a couple of days later, you say, you know, that, that phone call really bothers me that someone spoke to you like that, so then I decided, I'm not sharing those phone calls anymore. You know, like, I don't want him carrying that. That's not helpful. So I don't do that anymore. I just, that's, I don't want him thinking about that, thinking about me, thinking about I'm responding. But on the other hand, too, my family takes advantage sometimes in our personal time, saying, you should be doing this and this and this, and my response is, call 311. <laughs> <laughs> I'm off right now. I'm not listening to you. But the reality is, too, is I think, and I don't know how other people, is that, you know, I'm an introvert, right? This is how I exist in the world. 
is as an introvert, so it is costly. And anyone who's out there that's an introvert will know exactly what I'm saying. It is costly for me to have a public presence. It takes a different, it's not how I, I think you're actually saying this, you know, is, is, is that that's not how I would normally choose to engage in the world. I have chosen to do this, and so I need different things to be able to respond, uh, uh, and how I'm going to recharge myself, how I, you know, I do that, and my family's very important, and similar, they're, they're proud, they're engaged, they, you know, see opportunity, but it is, um, there's some days I just have to say to them, and I have said to them, I cannot speak right now. I just need some corona silence down. So I'm just going to take, you know, come home from council meeting the next two hours, mm -hmm. not talking. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I thought your introvert comment was really interesting, mm -hmm. just to pick up on that, mm -hmm. because that's how I would describe myself. So it feels like there are three <laughs> introverts up here. I'll be filmed, um, you know. <laughs> pretty good work masks, if I can put it that way, an ability to kind of pull up what you need mm -hmm. to when you need to. But that does take quite an incredible toll on a person to do for any long period of time. To be not who you are uh, does um, take its toll. I don't have the same kind of family support situation um, as these folks. Hoping to get a dog in September. Let you know. <laughs> me determine whether or not I run. There you go. So, <laughs> whether or not I have to walk the dog. But uh, the family I do have has been very uh, supportive and helpful, and I think it's pretty key because it's not just the time at the meetings. Uh, again, not to scare you, it is absolutely rewarding. But there's a lot of reading, mm -hmm. so there isn't a council meeting that I don't have. You know. 50 to 100, 150 pages that has to be read, and I get it, you know, sometimes the day before, sometimes two days before, but fitting that into my work-life balance also takes time, and I, I certainly hear you with the after the council, I'll come home and, you know, I'll get, how is that, and I don't really want to talk about it. You get a good, bad, indifferent, but I don't want to relive my, the last two and a half hours. Um, and I often don't even want to talk about what's coming up on the meeting. It's just, it is what it is. Uh, on the other side of it, so much of what's involved in council is just truly interesting and fun to be part of. And particularly, you know, for me, one of the best committees I serve on with council is joint services. And we've watched that, that whole thing grow in Lunenburg County and do some really great work. But it's also really fun to be at that table and have the big debates and the good conversation about what could be next as a joint service and how do you maneuver that through the very cumbersome municipal process that kind of exists to uh, make that board function. So, mm -hmm. so we're, we've, we've moved into the sort of behind the scenes mm -hmm. stuff that happens like after council meetings. And uh, I guess I'm, if, you'd be, if you could just speak a bit to um, What's something that the voters will never understand about politics? <laughs> You're stumping us. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, could you repeat the last part? Of sure. It, yep. What's something that voters will never understand about politics? Thank you. I think in Mahone Bay it's been maybe doesn't answer your question directly, but in Mahone Bay we've had a lot of instances where people come in with what they feel is a very simple request. It should be easy to grant, really shouldn't be a problem, and they don't understand the process. They don't want to understand the process. They don't really care that there's a process. It's a simple request. Just grant it right now, and why can't you, and I don't really <laughs> want to know why you can't, just do it. And that's the piece I think that they find very frustrating. And you'll get in the community the fact that we are you know, obstructive, we're difficult to deal with, we're not business friendly, we're not resident friendly, we're not whatever. And someone wants something that they feel is simple that may actually be a bylaw change. So the, you know that can take six months, whatever length of time it takes. And it, we may all be in favor of it, but we can't move that process any faster than the province prescribes the process works. So we're kind of stuck. And, and the just desire not to understand, I think I find a little frustrating. Give us a little bit of benefit of doubt. <laughs> yeah, and, 
and I think just to, to again yeah. feed off of that one, um, so much of what what the public demands is also what they find frustrating. Mm -hmm. So the fact that um, there is a process, there's a reason that there's a process. There is a process so that you have an opportunity to um, seek out what problems may not be readily evident from the idea that someone has. There, there are maybe people or, or um, um, and issues that, you know, the ripple effect, things will happen. And if that isn't carefully thought out and, um, uh, you know, bylaw change or something, then, then you could just create a problem by, by, you know, moving ahead too quickly. So it's, it's cumbersome at times. It's, there's probably ways to streamline things for sure. But um, that is what they want you to do. They want to provide opportunity. They want opportunity for um, engagement, for um, for people to respond to issues that are going on, to have their op for it to be in the public realm long enough for it to actually get drilled down to the people um, it would affect, because it, people. You know, really don't pay that close attention to what's on our agenda, even though they're publicly available and in, in, in the public realm for some time. But until it's actually going to impact people, they're not really paying attention to what we're doing. So we have to make an effort through those processes to make sure, okay, uh, you know, pay attention. You know, we're we're going to make this change. You know, hello, and you know. It takes weeks for that to, to get out into the public realm and then to give people time to grumble or think about it and then get back to you. So, so there is a reason for those processes. And when people come to you with requests that on the surface and maybe eventually are really great ideas, they, they do have to, to go through a process and, and, and that's for a reason. And so having people understand that and appreciate the value in at least some of that um, is and ongoing, and, and probably some people never get it. <laughs> um, I think, too, I, I would agree with, uh, absolutely with the, with the comments. And I think for me as well, there's, um, and it's come up recently, is the issue of how you take leadership and how you look like you're representing the concerns of your residents. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if anyone's been following in Halifax, there's the... Uh, uh, the Steel Auto Group expansion of their commercial parking lot, which is in my district, which is causing a lot of grief on the part of folks. And, you know, there have been comments that, uh, you know, I've been passive, that I haven't come out and really, you know, charged through and whatever. And really, um, what my, uh, what I understand my role to be and what I've decided my role in this case is, is to make sure that the information is communicated very clearly and to be able to have the opportunity to communicate that across the board. So being able to facilitate meetings between Steel Auto Group and the, and the community group. So if I can charge a note and, you know, barrel and whatever, that would have been very difficult to, uh, to have had that relationship. And yet, um, so there's a critique and there begins to be some baiting on social media. You should be doing this. Where is our counselor? She's silent. You know, all this sort of stuff. Um, and, you know, there, the, so there, there's a different role sometimes when you're in that position that you're representing many concerns and trying to see that. You can have your opinion. I've made it clear, but it wasn't, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, a strong sort of, you know, um, uh, cheerleading sort of position, but it's this is the situation. This is what I personally feel. This is what I'm working towards and trying to work, move forward on it. And again, I know when we had our fire debate, again, uh, that there was uh, uh, one councillor that, that was going to potentially use the fire station, and one of mine was, uh, one of my district was up as well, leading the charge, being very vocal. Uh, that was not the role I chose to do. So it was listening, making sure I was engaging with fire chief, you know, staff, listening to residents, meeting with the fire un union, doing all that sort of stuff, bringing forward, trying to get a sense of what it was, but again, it was seeing you're silent, you're not, you know, working for our interests, but trying to provide very clear information about this is what's being said, this is where if you need to have the information, go for it. So th that will be a dilemma. You'll have to figure out your leadership sort of style and how you want to respond to that, but uh, there will be pressure on the part of people to feel you should be doing what I say and think you should be doing and taking my opinion and you're not, you're, you're, you're abandoning us or you're passive or you're not representing us. But there's a, you know, I represent 23, if not more, thousand people, right? It's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Diverse opinions. Mm -hmm. A lot of implications. And I just don't represent my district. I'm a regional councillor. When I'm sworn in, I'm not sworn in as District, you know, 8, Halifax Peninsula North. I'm sworn in as a member of regional council.
So at this point, I think we'll open it up to some audience questions and just start with the one that we had earlier. If you could talk a bit about what it's been like to be a woman in politics. Does that mm. capture? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If there's any pressure of any sort because of gender, or, or is, does it work in your favor, or how does it go? I, I have a bunch of comments on that, but um, I'll, I'll start with the one that um, we just uh, celebrated at International Women's Day that in Lunenburg town specifically, um, there's there's female leadership across the board. So we have a female MP, a female MLA, and a female mayor, which is um, somewhat of a, um, a cause for celebration, I think. <laughs> but the fact that that's a cause for celebration speaks, yeah. says something as well, right? This this yeah. this is not the norm. This is not been, typical. Yeah, this is yeah. unusual. Yeah. So. Um, I, you know, starting from that perspective, I'm the only female on my council. I'm, I'm the mayor, but I'm the, uh, the only um, the, the woman uh, on council as well. So um, I do think that there's a difference in perspective, um, and I think that, uh, uh, that I, I um, very much value my male colleagues' opinions, but in, in certain issues, um, it's, it's, I, I can feel the gender divide, and I feel the pressure to, to speak up. Um, and, and women's issues is particularly so. Um, they, um, they don't get it lots of times. And it, so I do feel the pressure of trying to um, enlighten <laughs> to a certain extent. Um, but uh, I also think that, that sometimes it's perceived. I know when I went into the, uh, my uh, first election, um, I was the only female running. I got the most votes. And a number of the people on my council said, oh, well, she was the only woman. <laughs> so it was like a sympathy vote. You know, it's like, you know, that's why, you know, they, they, they thought there should be the token female. So she got the most votes. So took a little bit of exception <laughs> to that categorization. And the fact that it exists is, you know, unfortunate. So um, I, I, there's definitely a, a need, and I would encourage more women to become involved in in. Uh, government at every level and um, it's uh, there are um, obstacles to overcome in, in having that happen for sure and, and just gender so in your council situation you, you have to be fairly strong but they have elected you as mayor so that's a, mm -hmm. a good indication that they Hopefully, see you as a but that doesn't always happen no no <laughs> so I don't I'm, so I'm yeah. often yeah. not often but not infrequently the sole descendant yeah. Descending vote, you know, and and I think that's partly because of that ch that difference in perspective mm -hmm. on, on certain issues, which is, mm -hmm. yeah. So <laughs> come on on. Um, I guess I come at it a little bit differently. I've always wanted to be at the the table with the guys. I don't really want my own table. Um, our council has two women on it. I think. Our role is incredibly valuable, but it's just because it's a different perspective. And I think that's the key for me. It's, it's having diversity on those councils, mm -hmm. people with different backgrounds, people with different perspectives, different genders. Um, all of that brings so much. So we have, it, it, we can watch our council split between, um, let's say, private sector business owners and former public sector people. Mm -hmm. There's a different vision as to how things should work just because of their their life backgrounds, uh, their experience. So, um, and that certainly, um, I think there's a, there's a different way of looking at the world if you're female or male, which is healthy to have both of those perspectives. Um, but I also think we could use a lot more diversity on our council in, in age, um, in background, <coughs> in all of that. I think all of those those opinions are really important, and they're they're largely unrepresented. I mean, they, they um, there's certainly a very um, retired or able to be away from work piece to it as well at the moment. And that I find um, I push back a fair bit around, not because I can't necessarily get to a daytime meeting, but I feel like anyone should be able to be on council and so those meetings need to be accessible and so I don't let them push me around too much I just um, I 
try and stick to that. So those are the pieces for me that are most important and making sure that councils are accessible to people. So, you know, it's not unlike Halif Halifax, I don't actually know how well you guys are paid, but certainly right. around here, this isn't even a good part-time job or a good part-time, part-time job. So you have to have some balance in terms of accessibility for people, or you only get the retired um, people. Yeah, so we, we are well paid. We get about yeah. 85000 a year, plus benefits, plus you're in the HM pension plan. Uh, cool. So it's it's good. And my, my, and it is, but it's a full time job, yeah. right? There's no way you can be doing this, uh, uh, I think, effectively, in my personal opinion, <coughs> unless you're doing it full time. And, you know, my, my sort of point is that a single parent with two kids should be able to do this job. Mm -hmm. Should be compensated well enough that that, that is always within reach for someone who's considering running that they would be able to do that so it's adequately compensated to do because precisely I think around the decision-making table it's important to have that diversity it's important to have people that have lived through long experiences and and can share that wisdom it's important for people who have young kids to be at council so they they can bring forward that it's important for young people to be at council it's important for women it's important for people of different racial backgrounds or different you know newcomers to Canada they're bringing that experience because all of that draws into our ability to really understand who our community is in all its diversity and be able to respond in, 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 in ways to provide that information. So if councils are set up only to continue to have people who are uh, from a certain sector in your community, it's not really allowing, I think, for, for, for good representation, for the democratic process to work and for, for effective uh, decision making to happen. I mean, specifically around uh, the gender issue, um, when I, I have a degree in planning and I did it looking, my thesis on looking at planning from the perspective of women for, for cities, and there were real issues. There's a lot of research there and real issues about how women experience the city and how planning can be more effective around that. And I think that that brings those, you know, so there is that image and we might all get to one day where in fact we all know what it's like to be with a stroller on a sidewalk that's non-existent or non-effective, but you know, there, there are different ways because of our of, of many of our roles that now exist uh, about women experiencing the city in the way around violence and many different things that I think can has a direct impact on municipal policy, that that voice, you know, unless you understand that and know that are there, it's not going to be heard. And I think you, you've mentioned that in terms of, of what's going on. So it is important to have, uh, to have folks. I just, not to take too much of it, but I find I vote, you know, people say, oh, you know, Halifax Regional Council is always split between rural and urban, or it's always Halifax and Dartmouth, or it's always this. I find I go around on votes, I can be, Voting with someone, you know, that sits across from me on an issue as passionately, you know, and then two votes later be on the absolutely opposite side just as passionate, right? And maybe we can get a more, I'm going to do a session around how you make your decision about, you know, vote trading and all that sort of stuff and, and whatever. But, you know, really it, there is something about issues as well that don't fall along, you know, specific lines that, that you... You know, I know the people that I sort of, on certain issues that I, you know, feel are really solid and represent something and, 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 and I'll vote with them on that, but i got to tell you, you know, two votes later, I'll just say, I don't know not what that person's talking about. How can they possibly, especially in public, say that and then vote that way, you know, like, I mean, and that was a person that, you know, I was strategizing with on the vote two, you know, two times before. So depending on the issue, and, and I found that I have to let that go, you know, like I cannot, in where it's really 17 people pressing a button, right, no one else is doing that, that you have to be able to figure out, so that's something I think you, you have to be ready to think about, how you're going to work with people and maintain, you know, the relationships and let go of what you need to let go of and then get back on again because it's really about the issue and it's about what's in the best interest of your residents and the municipality and that that is going to be a changing vote that you're going to be in. So when you push the button, I don't know too much about it, but are, does it identify you as voting in a certain way? Well, in, in our council, it, yeah. every vote is recorded and it's shown on the screen and okay. then as a public yeah, thing. So, so so that's what I also tell so people, like there's no abstention as well. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. vote yes or no, you can't even say I don't know how to vote or I don't want to vote, oh, wow. that's a no vote. 
If you go and remove yourself, which some counselors have done and sat in the gallery, it's a no vote. In order to physically not vote, you have to leave the chamber and then your, your markdown is absent. And I've seen some counselors do that. They've walked out of the room because they're not ready to vote on it, which I personally have a problem with. But anyway, uh, but you know, so there's no abstentions, it's yes or no, and in our case, it's recorded, it's very public. That's how you do vote. Yeah. In our case, you put your hand up. In our case, you put your hand up. So you're there. So anyone else have a question for the you don't panelists? Want to your head about that. <laughs> How accommodating is cancer for people with disabilities? Like I have a vision disability, for example. I don't know that we have a great deal of experience, so I think it would be I, I would be I would hope we would be very accommodating, and yeah. that you would make those um, um, you know um, electronic or, or whatever worked for the person who would be running, and um, it would be very good exercise to have to find that out. Yeah. I know for for our council, particularly yeah. we're small, and I know um, for physical disabilities, you know, we as public buildings and that sort of thing, we, we have to be accommodating for that sort of thing. Our, our meetings and everything have to be held in, no matter what, you know, committee meetings or whatever, have to be in accessible locations. But for particular disabilities, I would say that we um, don't have a great deal of experience that I could yeah. comment on. I don't think there are any particular barriers that I'm aware of. I think I think we would it would be challenging for us, but I think that that's that would be a good challenge for us. Yeah. And uh, and certainly I think through our clerk's office they would then respond. What what are the tools that we need to put in place to make sure that uh, that there's effective you know communication and and uh, and debate and and we have an accessibility advisory committee that has been really trying to work on some of these issues as well. But uh, no, I think it would be very important. And often that's how change happens, right? As well, mm -hmm. it's, it's through the leadership of people coming with specific, uh, you know, uh, gifts and opportunities for us to consider. So, mm -hmm. yes, I think each. Uh, my question goes to each council or regional council probably ha is made up of different districts, wards, etc. The have and the have nots. It's a question I think that even faces our country. How do you deal with? the have not saying, oh, they always get everything. Because you see a large portion of the budget going towards the greatest <coughs> store that has the biggest tourist attraction, that has the most capacity to well, you know, to get jobs for economic development, et cetera, et cetera. How do you, what, what's your response to, oh, Halifax gets everything, or the town of Lunenburg gets everything, or something like that? How do you respond to that? We're actually elected at large, mm -hmm. so we don't have quite the same. Um, okay. We're not divided. Yeah, we're not divided. Everyone is there representing the whole community. Doesn't mean our residents don't complain when Main, Main Street gets paved over Pleasant Street or any other street that doesn't touch the downtown and the harbor. Okay. Um, we still have those issues, and those are driven by all kinds of, of different um, different things. Uh, you maybe have a better. Yeah. So it really boils down to good communication and understanding that because, you know, um, so I hear it in this way. Your Halifax, rural people get nothing. We pay high taxes and we get nothing. I talk to my residents, we pay high taxes and we get nothing, you know? <laughs> so there's the rural and urban thing. And then it's the south end. This wouldn't have happened in the south end, you know? So even in the urban area, the south end got that, we don't get that. And then even in my district, you know, in that area, they get this, but we're here and we don't get, I mean, it, it can go on and on. And, and so generally, it's just a me measure, but it is hard to keep, you know, there's so much happening all the time, it's hard sometimes to communicate everything, but it's just having really clear information uh, that, that comes out that, that shows, you know, the, this is the investment. So around our budget, for example, we try to be really clear. We have a very open budget process. Uh, we have a participatory budget process. People can come and speak to us, and at the end of it, what we talk about is these are the investments and where they're happening and why they're happening, and then also in, almost in a, a try to address it in a cyclical thing. For this five years, like around our transit plan, we're investing in the urban core, high density area. Five year, in five years' time, we're going to be looking at a new plan, which may take us in different direction in terms of doing that. But this is the place where we're going to focus now, and just try to be really clear about the rationale about that. But you know, you, 
it, it, it's kind of a fallback, and in some ways it's sort of, uh, you know, I find, I think somebody alluded to it earlier, you know, that people will just say, well, that's the way it is, and, you know, or I think you had mentioned, you know, uh, saying that uh, that's what they think, and, and it is kind of like it's, it's people not wanting to engage and really understand what's happening. And, and people have to be ready, when you have to be ready to really communicate that clearly and in, 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 a, in a very helpful way, but two, people have to be ready to listen to it. So sometimes it's getting beyond that point where you can engage with people, where they really engage in that and say, the reality is, you know, your community got this. This is amazing. This costs this amount of money. And, and that's a huge investment. What else would you like to see, and how can we move forward in that? So I think it's also incumbent upon us to try and get out to more rural areas as well, as regional councillors that bring the urban core in and have those conversations. So. As a supplemental? Um, we'll just, well, maybe we'll come back to it so we have a chance to get a, sure. a number of different ones. I think I saw one here. Um, I'm horrible at remembering people's names. And I'm sure some of your residents are upset when they've dealt with you on a municipal matter and you're like, uh, where do you get? <laughs> do you have any issues with that or any tips and tricks for how to negotiate around that situation? I have issues with it, no tips or tricks. <laughs> <laughs> Can you repeat the question please? <laughs> can't hear you. Oh, yeah, can't hear you. Um, yeah. I was just wondering how, how they deal with remembering everyone's name or if they've had people upset with them that They've dealt with them on something pretty closely, and then a year later, they're at the grocery store, and it's like, oh, hi, I'm so-and-so, what's your name? It, I, just, it, I find it incredibly difficult. I'm not only bad with names, I'm bad with faces. Mm. And so <laughs> I just probably don't remember I just met you. Yeah. And, and that's very difficult, particularly because everyone will know you. Oh, sure. So they just assume you know them. Um, and I've tried the, oh, I'm sorry, I can't remember your name. That hasn't particularly gone well for me. Um, so I usually get back, well, you, so you should, or something equally unhelpful and no name. So I'm not sure. I can give you advice on that. Maybe you can. <laughs> Maybe you have a no, better. It's, it's, a, it's a skill that you just, you really, it's, if you can, if, you know, anyone has advice to offer, um, I'd be happy to receive them. I have some horror stories, too. Yeah. Um, you know, my neighbor um, was coming up to me in the grocery store. I just moved in recently, and, and I'd met her at a newcomer's event. So, of course, you know, I, and that connection should have been really solid. And she came up to me in the grocery store, and I said, have we met? Yeah, I'm your neighbor. I am. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, there's, there's not always a smooth thing, but I... I yeah, it, working on that, trying to, to come up with clues and um, whether or not you reveal your hand too early or, or hope that maybe uh, it'll come to you um, if you prolong the conversation. It's a, it's a skill that uh, I, I share your, your pain. So my, my fears are valid. Yes. <laughs> yes. And it's hard, particularly if you get people out of context. Yeah. Yeah. So you've met someone in the no. gym mm -hmm. and now they're dressed up at a banquet yes. and it's, yes. it's like, you know. Yeah. So. Uh, they'll yes. just assume I can't see them, and they'll tell me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, yeah. yeah, so I, th I think it may be a little bit different than you folks' context because yeah. you're in a smaller community with a smaller number of people. Yeah. But so it's a little bit of advantage. You know, the districts, as I said, twenty-three thousand people. People kind of give you a little bit of grace on that. But I'll, I'll just be honest. Sorry, I just I know we've met. Just remind me again. I just can't get it. And you know, people actually generally tend to be fairly. Uh, you know, I think honesty is sometimes the best thing. Uh, sometimes I'll wait a bit because I think it's going to come to me, you know, and then, and they'll see on my face that I'm, you know, rolling out. And then I'll, oh, so yeah, I remember we did this and ah, you know, and then the connection happens. And uh, if you're in a situation with another person, like if you're at social events, what works really well, and I've sort of trained my partner, is that I'll say, oh yeah, hi. And then he'll introduce, oh, I'm Richard, you know, so what's your name? And then it saves me having to do the introduction, right? Because he knows. Because we walk down the street and people say, oh, hi, how's it going? And we walk down and say, who's that? <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, I don't know, you know? So it's, it's, there's a few tricks, you know. If, if somebody's with you, that they take the initiative to do the introduction, and then, and then that brings forward the, the name and doesn't necessarily put you on the spot all the time. But I often go to events by myself, so yeah. it's not really back there? Hi, um, I'm actually not running. I'm one of those people who's just interested. Mm -hmm. And I've heard from many uh, counselors uh, that there is this 
kind of lack of interest in participating or understanding the process. What's your advice to me about how to understand the process? The, the information is there, so I think it might d depend on your level of interest in the particular topic or issue or, or um, what, why they're, what, what the process is around. But the, the, the processes are usually fairly well laid out, and, and um, unfortunately, sometimes they're buried in, in, in amongst um, you know, a big chunk of, liter of, of um, legislation. So it's just a matter of, of I think, um, asking, and, and uh, you can be provided with that you know, portion of it that explains it, I would, I would hope. You know, it, it, isn't, it isn't usually that complicated. It's just a matter of, of appreciation that there is a process involved, and it's usually you know, fairly well laid out. Was that the process about running or the process of trying to figure out what it's like to be a counselor? Uh, no, it was more about just engagement with municipal politics. Okay. Um, so, you know, if, for instance, I know about an issue and I, and I want to help yep. with making that issue, you know, work, mm -hmm. um, What's, what are my options for understanding before I come and say, you need to do this? I would like to be able to inform myself about the process that I'm going to have to go through with you. And so some of that's probably the onus is on you, which is not necessarily the best answer. But for example, I, I serve on a, uh, a bylaw review committee. And so one of the things we wanted to look at was our tree bylaw. Mm -hmm. Well, in a small municipality like Mahone Bay, that means I need to go do my own research. So that's what I do. I go out and look at, you know, what are the bylaws in other areas? What are other people thinking about? Does Halifax have one or don't they? And why, yes or no? Uh, what are the uh, things around that? In terms of being involved with council, I think it's, it's a matter of picking up the phone and asking at the town hall, is there a meeting I can go to? Is there a pro you know, what's the process? Particularly people, most residents bump into that with planning, in my experience. So that's where the issues fall. So some of it's just that when you, you know, you, you sit down and you look at a plan for your community, most people, most counselors probably don't sit back and say, what happens if a company buys 20 properties around them and how do we plan against that? Like that's... That's just, those things people think about when they happen because it's really difficult to sit back and figure out what all those possibilities might be and how you deal with them and then what's on both sides of them. So with, with planning, there are typically um, public meetings and all of that kind of thing, often in odd places in the process, but they're there. Um, so really, if it's an issue that's just starting to come up, I would I would contact your town hall. I think that they would give you um, at least some direction on how you can be involved. What's coming? What council meeting is the best one to go to? Some of that kind of thing. Uh, it's interesting. It's an interesting exercise to go to each of the councils because the meetings are all essentially the same in terms of process but they're all very different to attend. So it's really interesting to look at the differences that can be made with the same process. It's kind of quite fascinating. It's also very frustrating if you're you know, out trying to ask five councils for money for a region-wide project and they all have different rules about when you can appear, how you can appear, how long you can talk, and all of that. So that becomes quite uh, cumbersome as well in terms of being able to be at a council if you want to provide input, if you want to just come and sit, then that's, that's easy too. Yeah. yeah, so I think, uh, you know, for us there would be a variety of ways. You could touch base with your counselor saying, this is an issue that's really important to me, how can I provide feedback? Mm -hmm. uh, often if it's a particular issue, we might have a, an advisory group, like if it's active transportation, we have an active, active advisory group, so you can actually apply to be on that committee to help you shaping the policy into the future. Mm -hmm. Um, at our standing committees, there's now public participation, which you can go up and speak for five minutes. So transportation, economic development, you know, um, whatever all our six standing committees are, as well as community council. There's always an opportunity of public participation for five minutes that you could raise, raise that issue. You can also submit a petition to council. 
which we're having kind of an argument about what happens with those petitions these days, but you can, you can submit a petition to council. So you can actually become a member of a committee that's helping to shape the policy direction, uh, or you could also, we try to do our public uh, a consultation now with lots of web-based stuff like surveys and things, uh, as well as public meetings. So there's a variety of ways we're really trying to uh, engage with residents. So depends how active you want to be involved in it and where we are with that issue and how we've been responding, uh, responding to it. So there's a variety of ways. But your counselor should be able to inform you this is the array, right? This is how you can do it. And they should be sending out information around all the public consultations which are happening. I try to spend a lot of time in doing that. This, because we're doing a lot of public consultation. This, 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 this. So, you know, try and see if there's something there that you're interested in, and this is when the meeting is, or this is the link to the survey, or whatever. What do I do if my counselor doesn't respond? Well, you can, um, okay, so I, I was going to mention this before in, in, in not remembering names. You know, often people say, oh, I emailed you. And so the first thing that comes right about, I hope I responded. Because, there are many things I don't respond to. It's just overwhelming, and depending on the week, like this week, I probably was really bad on responding to emails, simply because there was a lot of this happening, like high-level, stressful, <coughs> thinking things through sort of stuff. I, I, I just, I'm sorry, I could not respond to your email about that. I just, that was beyond me, my capability, right? Or I did not get back to your phone call about that because it was beyond my capability this week, simply where my brain needed to be. So I would go back and I say to people, and in and and public meetings I'll say, if I have not responded to you, please remind me. Say, I sent you on this date and you didn't respond, can you please follow up to me? Or you didn't respond to my phone call. Because it's not often intentional, it's just simply overwhelmed. I can't even get my stuff to my assistant. I have a part-time assistant, right, who's responsible for 50,000 people because we share it with another counselor. So the reality is, I can't even get the stuff coordinated to send it to her often some weeks, right? So the reality is, is that just go back to your counselor and say, I really would like to do that. And then, you know, people will often go to the mayor say, you know, I, I would like to, you know, have this as an issue for me, can you find out? Or go to staff person. That's the other thing, is that our staff, people sometimes don't want to call, contact our staff, and in the end, you know, if you phone 311 and say, this is my issue, I would like a staff person to call me, you have to specifically request that. In our situation, the staff person should call you, and then, you know, I say, if that doesn't happen, you contact me, and I'll find out why the staff person didn't contact. Because it shouldn't really be my having to do staff people's work, you know, if it's simply a straightforward manner trying to get information across. So, you know, contact staff in the department and say, I, I'm concerned about this. Can someone respond to me uh, with a phone call about what, what this issue is? So you can try. But don't give up on your counselor. It could, it could be a just simple, overwhelming stuff. So we're just, uh, sorry, we're just going to... Uh transition into lunch in a, in a moment here and one last question um, from us would be what's your escape hatch from politics so what do you do to get to get a break or get away <laughs> there, there's not off, there's not always one and you mean just for in the pro, while you're in office and, and if you just need some time some downtime um, not necessarily in office maybe like other people have said that they love spending time with their family or that they watch Netflix so it's just like what do you do when you get home after a council meeting and you're like I just need to get away <laughs> you, you, you need to ask for the space I think you know as Jennifer had mentioned before sometimes you just need to decompress and you need to do that on your own time it's difficult um, it's it's um, something that's um, I'm sure is different for for every individual I would I would guess and um, uh, it's getting out of the community for me is key. Um, whenever I'm in the town of Lunenburg, I'm the mayor. Um, you know, so I go to the grocery store. I'm still the mayor. <laughs> I, you know, pick up my mail. I'm the mayor. So um, if I really need some some downtime, I, you know, go to Halifax or somewhere else where I'm nobody. <laughs> and that's, uh, Not quite. <laughs> that's um, that really helps and is important. But it's it's hard to even get away sometimes. But uh, yeah, you need to do that every now and then to recharge. So um, I play a phenomenal amount of solitaire. I'll confess that right on on my iPad. That's what I do. I must have like 
thousands of games I've gone through. It's not challenging, it's just repetitive, it's just, you know, whatever, it's luck of the draw sort of thing. So, you know, I will, um, you know, I'll do that. In terms of, you know, uh, it's, what's interesting is we're not allowed to take any of our uh, iPads or phones outside the country. So that's a big relief for people. You know, if they go outside the country, you know you can't take your stuff with you. And so uh, you're completely cut off. Right? So that, that's a forced thing. There are some places in the province that have very bad cell phone. I feel very badly for those people, but i got to tell you, I enjoy them a lot. So when I go and visit my relatives in Cape Breton, I know the spots, and it's lovely. Because there's nothing I can do. I'm just here with family, and, you know, I can't, I can't connect, and that's awesome. So you sort of have to sort of figure out your, your, your place and time, because it's hard not to keep checking your phone, right? Is there something happening? Should I be on top of it? Is there something going on? What's happening, you know? And, and the high sort of rate of, you know, uh, social uh, media stuff. So being completely outside of, the, of, of that as, as a thing that you can access does, I think, really help. And then just put right on, you know, your email. I'm away. I don't have email or phone contact or, or, or monitoring social media. I'll be back in the state. This is who you need to contact. So, I guess I do three things: um, wine, travel would be the first two, um, and then the third one for me, it I like just to take a mental vacation. So I like to go work on some other problem, something different, and I that's the same strategy I use in work. So if work's driving me crazy, then I'll go now do something with my now Luna River County Committee or with council. Or, but just looking at the world through a different lens just gives me a mental break from whatever it was that I was dealing with on council. And that's the piece that works for me. Great. So thank you so much to our panelists. And I think, uh, I think some of you are sticking around for during lunch. So if there's some, maybe that there's some questions that didn't get answered, perhaps. You're approachable, and uh, we have lunch here, so we'll invite you to grab food, and we'll be back at 1 p.m., please.